Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. We have um, a wonderful opportunity to gather together to think about some of the most pioneering work going on in the world that we all care deeply about, driving the values of nature ever more in a mainstreamed kind of way into our thinking, into our decision making in a lot of different contexts and a lot of different regions. <clears throat> and today we have um, a really special occasion. We're focused on the value of natural infrastructure in urban planning. Um, and indeed, our community has been focused ever more on cities, and especially so um, right in this time. It feels so urgent and like such a tremendous challenge uh, to reconnect people with nature in cities and also a tremendous opportunity. There are enormously interesting research frontiers. Um, I, one of my favorite frontiers is in, in relating nature experience to health, physical health through physical activity and other um, aspects of connecting with nature and also mental health, both cognitive functioning and emotional well-being. And there's so much more to learn. We can tell kind of every week new papers come out relating uh, nature experience to health, especially among urban people who um, really have a nature deficit in many ways. And so um, here we are <clears throat> together. We have an amazing week. Karine just led a paper that came out um, presenting INVEST, one of the tools available for making this research ever more accessible and actionable and lowering barriers to engaging with others in um, driving this science forward and driving the action forward. So I'd like to just introduce very briefly the Natural Capital Project. It's a large partnership of about 300 different partners in both research and also in practice worldwide that's come together. The core partners are listed just below on the screen, come together to help drive this innovation in the science, very interdisciplinary. Uh, using the incredible advances in technology and through partnership, hand in hand, to enable people and nature to thrive. Um, so like I said, today we'll be focusing in this conversation on um, <clears throat> nature-based solutions and natural infrastructure. And I guess with this slide, I just want to say that um, the main objective here is to learn from one another. So we hope to have just a nice relaxed um, time together and um, we invite your feedback and conversation um, here um, in discussion format and also later in following up with people. And I'll turn over to Perrine to help um, us dive in, just focused on nature-based solutions in the Asia Pacific region trends in urban planning, differences um, in this region as compared to other places, really innovative examples. And no one's better than Karine Hummel, who um, co-led our cities program at the Natural Capital Project for many years, and who's now um, a professor at NTU in Singapore and continuing to drive really pioneering work in this area and to help us connect across the world so thank you, and over to you, Perrine. I'll stop sharing my slides. Thank you very much, uh, Gretchen, for, for the introduction and, and for these uh, kind words uh, to introduce the session. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and it's indeed my great pleasure to um, moderate this session and we have three great panelists uh, today uh, joining us. Um, 
Rita Padawangi, Prof. Rita Padawangi is an associate professor uh, in sociology at the Singapore University of Social Sciences. Um, she has uh, extensive experience in the um, sociology of architecture, social movements, and participatory urban development. And uh, I met Rita through an online conference uh, as it goes these days. Um, and I was really struck by her insightful comments uh, coming from a sociology perspective on urban flooding issues. Um, and, and I know you'll, you'll find the, her comments and, and perspectives really interesting for the conversation today. Uh, we're also joined by Leonard Ong, uh, who is from Ramble Dreisaitl, uh, Studio Dreisaitl. Um, and Leonard uh, is a landscape architect expert in planning and water sensitive urban design, uh, working at the intersection between man and his environment with the aim of finding a long term sustainable balance between the two of them. Um, so themes that are really uh, close to my heart and I'm sure uh, really resonating with uh, a lot of the work that you joining in the audience uh, relate to. And finally, um, Eric Wolf, uh, who is a PhD student uh, soon to graduate uh, at Monash University. Um, Eric Wolf is a, uh, has a background in civil and geotechnical engineering. Um, he uh, also expanded his expertise uh, through his PhD uh, in the field of nature-based infrastructure uh, and flood risk management in the context of informal settlements. Um, so three really diverse um, experiences and expertise, uh, which will really shed a, a different light on, on this conversation of green infrastructure in urban planning. The conversation today uh, will follow this, this schedule. Um, I'll just give a little bit of background on nature-based solutions in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, just to set the scene for those of you who are less familiar with the Asian environment. Um, then we'll uh, go through the three presentations, perhaps in a different order. I thought I would start with, uh, since we're in Singapore here, uh, I would start with uh, Leonard um, with uh, some uh, highlights of what this uh, conversation means in Singapore, uh, and then Rita and Eric. Um, and finally, uh, we'll uh, really use this time as an opportunity to, to discuss. So I'll lead the conversation with a few questions and really encourage you to ask questions and, and share uh, your own feedback uh, through the Q&A box. Um, I'd like to uh, remind you if um, you are interested in re-watching the webinar or if you have colleagues uh, interested in the webinar, we'll be uh, making it available uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll send some of the slides uh, presented today in a thank you email. Um, you'll also have an opportunity to reach out directly to the panelists, of course. Um, just uh, additional housekeeping uh, items. I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Zoom uh, system by now, uh, but please do use the Q&A box for any questions throughout the webinar. Um, and, and if you have any logistical or technical questions, you can use the chat box. Or feel free also to use it to say hi, maybe say where you, you're coming from if you'd like to, to engage. So without further ado, um, I'll dive in and, and give a little bit of, uh, of context on the um, Singaporean and Asian perspectives on, on these questions of uh, natural infrastructure in urban planning. Um, first things first, uh, what do we mean by natural infrastructure? I'm assuming if you've tuned in today, you are already fairly familiar with this topic, um, but just to uh, make sure we're on the same page. Uh, I'm talking about essentially anything green and blue in, in a city uh, and around a city. Uh, so this ranges from urban parks, um, whether they are small neighborhood parks uh, or, or larger parks, um, allotment gardens or community gardens in cities that are gaining uh, a lot of popularity around the world. Uh, can be water bodies uh, or peri-urban forests. Um, uh, as well as coastal ecosystems, mangroves, for example, uh, but also a range of more engineered, engineered uh, systems, uh, such as street trees, um, green roofs, uh, or 
rain gardens, uh, bioretention systems, a lot of jargon we, we use in urban water management um, and that essentially cover the, the more built infrastructure that still relies uh, and uses the ecosystem services, the, the natural processes to, to manage water in, in that case. Um, and so these, uh, all these types of green infrastructure are, are really gaining uh, a lot of attention around the world. This is a picture of the Chulalongkorn University Centenary Park in Bangkok. Uh, quite an impressive project uh, that received uh, quite some attention, uh, especially in Asia, these last couple of years. Um, and it, it really, um, I think, illustrates well this tendency for um, incorporating nature-based solution in the city. So instead of building uh, high-rise buildings uh, and a shopping mall, perhaps uh, it was decided to develop this park um, that acts as a green lung in, in the city uh, and, and really promotes um, infiltration of water, so reducing flood risk in, in the city, uh, mitigating the urban heat island, uh, which is very relevant in the tropics in, in particular, but in, in many, many places. Um, and really um, uh, an amazing uh, new public space uh, that people, yeah, I believe there's a, a lot of urban agriculture also happening. Um, so this type of projects, this is obviously uh, quite a flagship project, uh, large investment, uh, but at much smaller scales, we see these projects coming up um, in Asian cities as in many cities around the world. So this is what we, we want to focus on today and really trying to understand in, in what way uh, this, this trend uh, is expressed in, in cities and what does it mean uh, in, in terms of future investments for, for cities. Um, just for the Asian background, um, I wanted to highlight that when we talk about natural infrastructure, we actually talk about um, a lot of different things, whether it's in the sustainable development goals, um, the new urban agenda, any resilient strategies, the, these types of nature-based solutions are, are gaining attention, but you can't talk about them without talking about climate resilience, without talking about urban planning and governance, um, and more generally about informality, uh, which is um, a very important part of the urban conversation, especially in Asia, uh, about financing. So all these themes are, of course, um, related, and we'll touch on many of these aspects in the conversation. Um, when we talk about Southeast Asia in particular, uh, I wanted to just give you a sense of, of scale for uh, a couple of these points. Uh, informality, uh, we're actually talking about a very large range of um, informal areas in, in cities, uh, from almost none in, in some of the wealthiest cities, if we're looking at uh, Singapore or, or in Malaysia with this, uh, less data. Um, but up to 50% uh, in, in some countries. So um, it's really an important part of, of the conversation. And I know um, the panelists will touch on this uh, today. Um, another kind of urban water lens uh, to, uh, to think about um, is in terms of infrastructure, is to think about the urban sewage uh, coverage. And, and this is important to, to realize if we have pipes and a sewer network throughout the city, uh, like in Singapore, the type of solutions um, uh, that are needed and appropriate are different from uh, an area that is still mostly um, without a, a pipe network uh, for, for sanitary systems. So um, this is again, uh, really explaining the range of realities that uh, we see in, in cities in Southeast Asia. Um, and to, to conclude this brief overview, I just wanted to highlight also another really important theme related to urban planning and, and governance, uh, which is uh, really the rapid growth of cities in Southeast Asia. Um, this is a, a diagram from one of my um, research fellow team members uh, who looked at the transitions for plausible IPCC um, scenarios uh, in, into the future. Uh, and we looked at where uh, did the urban land uh, come from. Uh, so a lot from farmland in, in that particular scenarios, but also forest and, and grassland. Uh, and so this is important to uh, remember when we think about this rapid growth uh, in, in cities um, and 
what type of ecosystems uh, it's actually encroaching upon. Um, if we don't look at the numbers, but uh, at the, the pictures, uh, I think this is even more striking. This is another project led by a PhD student in, in, in my group, um, looking at Maja, uh, Kota Maja in Indonesia. Uh, and you can see the really uh, rapid development that and what it means on the ground. So when you see these pictures, I think uh, one realizes um, the, the urgency of really finding some good design principles uh, to, to think about uh, the development of, of cities and what a balanced development between people and nature might look like. So this is for uh, the brief uh, overview. I hope this helps, um, I guess, highlight some, some of the key uh, topics of the, the discussion. Um, I will now pass it over to uh, Leonard, uh, I think, to, to start with. Uh, so I will unshare my screen. Um, and while I do that, I'll just mention that um, I've asked each speaker to uh, think a, a little bit about um, their own uh, work uh, through the lens of um, urban planning and, and natural infrastructure uh, and present uh, some of their key ideas. I'll, I'll have a few other questions um, on on this. Uh, and one first question that I've asked each of them is to share something that is not in the bio uh, as well, just uh, as a way to kick, break the ice and, and kick start the, the conversation. Um, so Leonard, again, country director uh, from uh, Rainbow Studio Dressidal in Singapore. Um, and uh, just as an additional point, I wanted to highlight uh, that he's actually working both in Singapore and Beijing, so has a lot of experience uh, here as well. And you'll see that a lot of his projects really take these uh, water sensitive urban design principles uh, at heart. So Leonard, thank you very much for joining us and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Karin. Uh, let me share my slides uh, a second. Sorry, this seat. Uh, not yet. Not yet, no. Uh, let me see. Uh, try that again, sorry. No worries. Mm, okay. See it now? Uh, yes, great. Yes. Just see the presentation and mode, and yeah. that's great. Thank you. All right. I thank you, uh, Bryn, once again, and thank you for the very interesting uh, uh, introductory pre presentation you showed. Uh, I'm here representing a Danish uh, engineering company uh, called Rambal. Uh, we have been um, uh, based in Copenhagen for 30 years, but uh, the Singapore office is set up, you know, more than 10 years ago. And we are here present in this region, which is uh, one of the fastest growing urban regions in the, uh, in the world, uh, because we want to uh, present solutions that will address some of the most intractable problems being faced by uh, urban developments. Um, uh, and the solutions we present are very much nature-based and looking at how to uh, uh, um, seamlessly integrate uh, nature with uh, uh, and our cities. So uh, I'll take looking at the traditional solutions, right? In this case, the canal, how do we uh, use nature-based solutions to uh, um, bring more uh, natural assets into play, right? Uh, and enhance the living environment, how we, uh, use, for example, in this case, bioengineering, right? Looking at how we um, recreate natural uh, river systems and then uh, using uh, natural retention to uh, allow uh, climate adaptation to happen. For example, in this case, um, providing spaces, not just for humans, but also for uh, flood adaptation. Uh, so this is a picture of a uh, Bishan Park in Singapore. Uh, this is taken by uh, um, uh, the newspaper after a uh, storm event. So this was designed for a one in a 25 year storm event. 
and uh, and and during dry season, it is a place for people to play. But during the wet season, yeah, it is uh, ability to accommodate a storm events. Uh, we also design spaces for nature, right? Uh, rendering from a competition we did a few years ago, uh, and uh, this was for a place in a, within a dense uh, built neighborhood in Singapore. And after implementation. It is really about understanding the needs, not just for humans, but for nature and the animals that is found in nature. And finally, you know, uh, with the limited spaces, especially in Singapore, how do we accommodate a highly dense built environment and but, uh, uh, but imbue nature within this dense environment? So this is a project called Kampong Emeraldi. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a high intensity integrated living hub for a child care, medical care, you know, where there's retail and there's a transport hub all layered in. And we wanted a space where we integrate all these different activities and provide a space for community to come together. And that's when we create the uh, uh, elevated uh, landscape on the roof, right? Uh, that is really a showcase uh, where it embeds uh, urban farming, playground, Right, and a diversity of uh, uh, nature loving um, uh, um, planting palette. And really, it's about the integration of architecture and nature that uh, gives it this special quality. With that, I end my quick presentation. Thank you, Perrin. Thank you, Leonard, for this uh, overview of uh, really interesting projects that uh, have been implemented uh, and that you've led here in, in Singapore. Um, perhaps just uh, one thing that is not in your bio that the audience might want to know today. All right, uh, I'm I'm very passionate. Uh, I'm I'm not just doing this for a job. Uh, I, I this is a passion for me, and uh, I. And during my free time, I collect orchids, especially miniature orchids. Aha, uh -huh, miniature yeah. orchids. Well, maybe we'll get to see a picture on the next slide. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll go for also a brief presentation from uh, Prof. Rita Padawangi. Um, so, Rita, feel free to uh, put up your slides if you'd like. Um, as I mentioned, Rita is a professor in sociology and her research includes the sociology of architecture, social movements, and conservatory urban development. Um, and her work um, focuses specifically on the humanistic aspects of city making, particularly place making in neighborhoods through collaborative approaches in research, teaching, and community engagement. Uh, so same thing, Rita, thank you very much for joining us. And if you can share something that is not in your official bio and a little bit about your work. Thank you, Perrin, for that kind introduction. Um, and I hope you all can see my slides and hear my audio clearly. Um, yes, and thank you so much also to Leonard for uh, starting uh, the session today. Uh, since uh, me, I also am based in Singapore, I was uh, tempted also to bring up the example of the Kalang River Bishan Park because it was one of the most popular uh, projects uh, that is very well known, not just in Singapore, uh, but also in the region. Um, and, uh, but, but then I saw, you know, I think Leonard will present on this. So I will just follow up on that uh, and uh, provide more examples uh, from outside Singapore. And since uh, Perrine asked me to uh, choose a, a project uh, that is my favorite. Um, I was thinking about that for 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 uh, for some time, and then I settled for this photo. Um, and this is actually a photo from a kampong from a settlement uh, in Jakarta. Uh, it is an urban poor settlement, and uh, they. Uh, and, 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 and as you can see, uh, there, there is some greening along uh, the canal. So this is actually a river 
um, but it has been uh, embanked and it has been intervened in, in two several canals towards the river mouth in Jakarta Bay. And so the story about this project was that uh, the community uh, is an urban poor community in Jakarta and they were facing eviction threat. And so uh, what they did was they organized and they mobilized and they, uh, they, they, they wanted to uh, make improvements to their own landscapes. And so they, they mobilized the resources that they have uh, and they create the space along the canal. So, uh, so unlike the usual images that you see that all the, uh, the houses are uh, really at, uh, occupying all the space along the rivers, they actually provided space along the river as a public space and then have this uh, greeneries along the river. And these plants, uh, some of them are, 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 are just for uh, landscaping, uh, but uh, some of them are also uh, productive plants. You can see some of the fruit trees actually along the, uh, along the canal and, uh, and, and, and that they can also harvest to consume. So um, why this is my favorite is because um, this is one of the solutions uh, that is actually possible for our cities of today and to follow up from Perrin's uh, presentation earlier that many of the cities in Southeast Asia uh, are still um, dominated by informal settlements uh, and it's, uh, it's really uh, not possible to imagine cities without uh, these settlements and so this is one of the solutions to, um, uh, to, to actually make uh, greeneries, uh, green interventions actually uh, accessible to everyone. And, uh, and uh, the reason why I bring this up is because this is the kind of solution that is often forgotten uh, when we uh, talk to policymakers today, because these are often seen as something that is too uh, menial and less pretty. Yeah, uh, and it does uh, require us to work with communities to be able to uh, come up with solutions that they can do uh, in order to um, make the uh, cities greener. And so uh, what is happening uh, in Southeast Asia today is that uh, a lot of interventions when it comes to riverbanks uh, and open spaces is that there are forced interventions uh, that is from the top you know so this is uh, this is an image from uh, uh, the river the same river actually a little upstream when it's still one main uh, river uh, across the city and there has been intervention along the riverbank in which uh, all the settlements uh, were removed and it's not just the settlements that were removed but as you can see, the greeneries were also removed. Um, and this is still a typical kind of uh, imagined or aspired interventions for rivers uh, in, in some cities in Southeast Asia, especially when they're dealing with uh, uh, rivers that are often flooding. Um, and yes, they have heard about uh, the, uh, the projects in Singapore, like the Kalang River, Bishan Park, but then uh, they always say that, oh, this is different. Uh, our rivers are bigger. And so we need a bigger intervention. But at the same time, it forgets uh, the green uh, and, and also the participatory uh, 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 kind of approach. And so uh, this is another project that I think, you know, uh, maybe later on uh, will respond to uh, some of the concerns that we have today. Uh, th this is another example. So while the, the first project that I show in the first picture was the community themselves mobilized. Um, here in this photo, this is an example from Surabaya in which uh, is actually the community uh, as well as uh, academics, uh, NGOs and uh, the private sector actually come together 
to just have this simple intervention along the river in which there's this uh, greening of the riverbank as well as uh, creating a rainwater, uh, a simple rainwater harvesting, um, uh, like a shallow uh, well, you know? So uh, this is mobilizing the young uh, architects in, 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 in a firm. Uh, that they they this is part of their training actually when they start working in the architecture firm uh, they were sent to 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 think about what, what can be a, a solution that is uh, uh, that that can be applicable for uh, communities along the riverbanks and and this is the kind of uh, uh, project it's a small project. Uh, but I think uh, I, I'm not sure about the sustainability, though. Uh, but I think you know it's it does create a meaningful experience at least, uh, and uh, plant the idea uh, that you know uh, greeneries. Yes, uh, there are uh, interventions uh, that are big interventions, big projects. But we don't always have to think about big projects. Uh, the small interventions uh, can also be meaningful, and they're important because. They are more accessible uh, for communities that everyone uh, can also participate to create these green interventions. And I think uh, uh, taking a, into account the context of uh, various cities in Southeast Asia, uh, this is one, uh, 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 one statement that I would like to make that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, nature-based solutions, uh, we need to also think about nature as something that is together with the people and not uh, a nature as uh, just nature, especially when we think about cities, uh, the nature that we see uh, is really something that is in interaction with the society in the cities. All right, so uh, with that, uh, I end my uh, brief presentation and I return the facilitation back, back to Perini. Thank you, Rita. Actually, I'll ask you one uh, last question, something that is not in your bio. Um, and, and really, thank you very much for sharing these insights already. I think we'll have some good conversation based on this. Something that's not in your bio. Well, well something that you haven't read in my bio. Well, uh, like Leonard, I, I'm also very, uh, I'm, I'm not just uh, doing this for work. Uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, passionate in, in this, and I think uh, I I am of the view that uh, uh, academia needs to work collaboratively uh, with uh, various stakeholders, and so we don't uh, we shouldn't actually stay in the ivory tower of uh, academia. So uh, that's why uh, setting all these uh, connections with communities uh, are very important. And that's actually one of the things in the Southeast Asia Neighborhoods Network that I'm coordinating, uh, in which we are promoting this kind of approach in which we bring research uh, and integrate research with our pedagogy uh, and to, to, to use our research also as our teaching tools to bring students uh, to learn from real life experiences uh, and bring them uh, as close as possible to uh, grounded realities. Thank you very much. And this is a conversation also very close to my heart. So I'm so we'll come back to that uh, a bit later. Eric, you are next, if you'd like to share your screen. Um, thank you also for joining us for this conversation and bringing your extensive experience in uh, implementing nature-based solutions in informal settlements. Um, we met through uh, joint connections, I think through the RISE program. Uh, I'm sure you'll say a little bit more about this and um, thank you for sharing this and also something that is not in your bio. The floor is yours. Yes. Um, thank you, Perrine. Um, thank you, Rita and Leonard. Um, would just like to acknowledge as a starting point that I'm very happy to be here. I admire both of your works. Um, and I would like also to thank Perrine and the Natural Capital Project for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I actually am going to start with the what is not in my bio. I think that is a, a good icebreaker. Uh, I think the first thing I would consider really important to say is that probably five years ago would never imagine that I would be talking about Asia, uh, 
in such an important conversation. I have a background in the global south experiences as well, but I'm originally from Brazil. Um, I have been over the last four years working in my doctoral studies in Australia, working directly with uh, communities in Indonesia and Fiji. And I think that's an important point to make that my experiences are grounded in close contact with the communities. That's how I've learned about Asia and that's how I've experienced my research. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that that is a good segue into the project I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm mostly going to talk about RISE. RISE is the Revitalizing Informal Settlements and Their Environments. It is a project led by Monash University. And I am, um, RISE is, consists of more than 150 people uh, across different disciplines. So uh, I would like to say that I'm also not speaking on behalf of RISE. I think I'm talking about my experiences inside RISE and my ex experiences working with communities uh, in the Asia Pacific region. So this first image here, I've selected it because I think it is uh, very representative of what I want to talk about. This is um, an informal settlement or uh, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, it's a fisherman village. And I think it exemplifies some of the challenges we've been having, which is the community um, tends naturally to encroach over um, natural assets or, or the ecosystem around them. And this brings a lot of challenges in the provision of infrastructure in the um, working with uh, environmental hazards, uh, floods, tsunamis, cyclones, all of those. And, and of course, there are challenges in terms of health as well, which links to what Gretchen was saying. Um, so what I wanted to talk today is about, I would start by saying very similar to what Rita said, usually the approaches that we've been seeing are very centered in external stakeholders and very often the community is not that involved and the solutions to flooding in informal settlements have been mostly centered around building walls and these very often in in many um, countries in asia we've been seeing this trend of the big climate proofing projects and they very often um, include plans of evictions relocating communities so i think that is a point i wanted to talk to about how we are testing other ways that not necessarily need to move people away but instead to work with them to improve their conditions on site so this is an image from one of the settlements i've worked in in indonesia um, and this is a photo while rise infrastructure was already under construction, but can have an idea of how the houses are elevated. So there's a very important part. There's local knowledge of avoiding the flood and the sites are very waterlogged as well. It's very flood prone. Next door, there's a rice plantation, which is the biggest indication of a flood prone site in Asia. Um, so I think the challenge is here. Um, this is what rise has been proposing. So RISE is uh, using nature-based infrastructures in the context of informal settlements. And I would say that there are three main components in RISE infrastructure. One of them is uh, what they call these um, biofilters. So these are the blue barrels on the left, and they are basically used to treat sink and shower water, gray water. And uh, for sewage, it's treated through a system of communal septic tanks that then the water is directed into constructed wetlands, which look more like plants, like um, um, plant tanks, like they, they look like flower pots, honestly. So it's, uh, and they're used to treat water. So I think um, this is the example of how RISE is testing nature-based solutions in a context of informal settlement and uh, looking at the health benefits of it. Um, the other part I wanted to talk about is my research in particular inside that. I think it is a very important to acknowledge the local knowledge and the power that the community has. So inside the big RISE project, my research specifically has been to work directly with communities on monitoring the floods. So we set up this citizen science project and we had 
uh, people from seven settlements in Suva and settles, six settlements in Makassar in Indonesia. And we asked them to monitor floods, send us photos frequently. So over the last two years, we started at the end of 2018, we received more than 5,000 photos documenting this water level. So this was really important for engineers to be able to model floods, understand the sites a little bit better and work with the community. So I think there is a value here that is not only about assessing the flood, but in involving people in the process of understanding the site, in the process of discussing the project and the, the, the situation. Um, so I think there is something in that direction. And yeah, just to conclude, I wanted to share the link here for the RISE program and my context. If anyone would be interested in hearing more about, I would highly encourage you to look at RISE website. And I would like to acknowledge all the RISE funders, um, Monash University, but also there are partners, uh, Stanford, Emory, and the partners, universities in the countries, University of South Pacific, Fiji National University, Hassanuddin University in Indonesia. Um, and yeah, this slide, I think, is just an image of how we've been understanding the floods and retranslating that knowledge from the gauges in a way that can be discussed with broader audiences, that can influence in the production of natural infrastructure, and that can be useful for the community again. So we, we need to keep this exchange going. Um, that was all I had to share for this brief presentation. Looking forward to the discussions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Eric, for presenting this uh, overview of the RISE project. Really important work. Uh, I encourage the, the audience to also check a lot of the new resources that have been added on the project uh, website, which we'll share the link to uh, a little later during the webinar. So um, thank you for really um, giving a, a a nice overview of the different types of, uh, of issues. And it's not surprising that urban issues are so complex and, and interrelated. Perhaps I'll kick off the conversation with one question and then encourage um, the audience also to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, to get us started, um, so two of you in the audience are part of academia. And uh, I know that this is also um, a, a part of the audience. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what um, do you think uh, are the best ways for academia and the private sector to collaborate on uh, nature-based solution projects uh, and, and maybe sharing some specific examples uh, in, in your work? Uh, let's start with Leonard again. Sure, Perrin. Um, I think um, they, the, the dialogue between the academia and the uh, business sector is really, really important. Um, in, in our business, we are looking for realized uh, uh, solutions that can be implemented. Uh, but you know, the, uh, when, when you're working in a city, you have the freedom to explore and push the boundaries, right? Uh, and as uh, we, uh, I'm constantly seeking ideas, you know, participating in uh, uh, dialogues with researchers, right, uh, in the university to gain new insights, you know, as to what is current. Uh, and so this is, this is the, the big advantage for this, this interaction, you know, we are grounded and, and they can look to the sky. That's a very nice way to put it. Uh, and thanks, Leonard. Indeed, coming from a, a very uh, large uh, engineering uh, and landscape architecture company, uh, it's interesting to see that you see value in, in generating ideas, uh, looking to the sky, uh, and, and really the time that academics may have more than the private sector um, in, in terms of the timeline. Thanks for sharing this. Rita. Uh, thanks, uh, Perrin. Uh, I I think you know uh, as Leonard was speaking, I remember actually a few years ago I had a student uh, from Denmark uh, who uh, came to Singapore for a summer course, uh, and eventually she came back to Singapore because she was interested to study more about uh, Kalang River uh, Bishan Park, and so I think she. 
Um, she said that she she did get connected to the designers uh, and um, and 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 yeah. So I I just want to point that out that you know uh, it's it's good that uh, that your uh, company uh, actually uh, do uh, welcome students who want to know more about about what you're doing and how you do it. Uh, and uh, for me myself, I'm also I I, I look at the Q and A box. There was a question about you know how to avoid you know parachuting science into the community right um now uh my approach actually in uh, i i don't get into studying uh, green interventions or you know community-based uh, flood uh, solutions i don't get into it just in my uh from my own head so what i did was actually um uh, I started with uh, uh, going into the community and then look at like what are their current concerns, um, and then uh, try to understand a bit more about why they are concerned about those things and what are the points of contentions, what are the problems. So we often, you know, when we are doing research, we have to. Uh, identify what is our research question and what is the problem that we want to investigate. And to me, it's really about going back to the ground and say that the problem actually I identified from the ground and not just from us, just by, uh, you know, yes, reading is important, our libraries are important, but when we are actually doing research on the ground, those knowledge has to be grounded. And we do need to realize that uh, different kind of communities have their own contexts. And well, while in Singapore, uh, the, the solutions like Kalang River, Bishan Park, or Kampung Admiralty are actually very, uh, is, is very good and very, uh, uh, is, is, uh, is something that is, uh, 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 that, that, that is, uh, you know, a groundbreaking and uh, and 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 very much uh, uh, popular these days. Uh, when we go to communities in Jakarta, in Surabaya, in Manila, in Bangkok, um, these kinds of solutions uh, need to be contextualized. Uh, and so, uh, to me, avoiding parachuting ourselves into these communities is that we we try to work, we have to work collaboratively with them, even in defining our research questions. And so uh, oftentimes, and I think this is a problem with academics and <laughs> academia right now, is that we are so pressured with, you know, all these uh, publications, right? You have to publish like two articles per year or, or even more, you have to publish books and all those things. And oftentimes you can actually achieve them without collaborating with communities. And that's that's one of the problems in academia right now. You can actually pro progress in your career without even engaging with communities. Um, and this uh, this actually is uh, is a challenge for us when we think about these uh, when when we think about the relationship between nature based solutions and our uh, con our urban context in Southeast Asia, because engagements with communities and collaboration with communities is essential. In trying, in really identifying uh, the, uh, the the best or most most contextual solutions for 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 each locality, and so I guess uh, it is also important for uh, academia to make this effort to um, to not parachute ourselves, <laughs> right, and changing the incentives in right. academia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Very much, Rita. Uh, Eric, would you like to add on the academia and private sector or local government partnerships and maybe parachute science if, if you have thoughts on this? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think it will be hard to make a contribution after the fantastic contribution by Rita. But uh, I think, I think yes, we are very aligned there, Rita, in many of the things you were saying. Um, I think my experiences in RISE is that if you're talking about these collaborations between industry and academia, it needs to be a two-way discussion, of course, and, and we need change in two ways. I think academia should be interested in grounded projects that are real, practical, and that, that are about engaging with communities. I think that is the first step. 
and engaging with real life and, and real necessities. And uh, I think on the other side, I think it's also very important that industry, in the case of RISE, there is a lot of funding. Um, the support for RISE mostly came from Asia Development Bank and from the Wellcome Trust, um, but also there is support from Australia's government, now New Zealand's government, Fiji and Indonesia's government. So um, I think the government should also be a part of this discussion and we need these big banks and we need these big companies to acknowledge that we cannot continue doing things the way we do. So academia is a fertile land for developing ideas, but it needs to be grounded in reality. So I think that, that it also brings the, the community in. So in the parachuting front, I think the, that is a very important point. And um, I think the, it's, probably interesting to highlight here that RISE is not initially a flood project. RISE is, is uh, operating in a framework of global and planetary health. Um, but we, being there, you understand that the first concern that people have are floods. So I think that was a component of the people being part of understanding the, the problem and understanding being part of the decision of what needed to be uh, worked. Uh, and yes, I think the, the citizen science was, I think there are ways of improving it further, but I think collaborating with a community, particularly in Indonesia, where they love these messaging apps, when you have a messaging app and you understand that people like it and they are familiar with it, that's a way of communicating. We just, decided to use that as a platform for sharing flood knowledge, sharing and creating a community to discuss floods. So I think um, this kind of nuance and, and, and care in how you proceed and how you do your research is really important as well. Thank you, Eric. I think from both your answers here also the I think the, the intention of the, the researchers is that it really matters the idea of care. Um, and, and recaring about the communities and, and the impact of the work and not the academic impact necessarily seems to be quite important. Um, I'm going to take a, a few questions from the audience. Um, in the interest of time, perhaps I'll direct this first one to uh, Leonard, um, who I think in some of your design you may have thought about this. Forests are the only land use um, that can achieve significant carbon drawdown, even with zero carbon buildings and transport CO2 to increase and warming continues. How can we couple forests into architecture and urban planning to achieve drawdown? Leonard, is that something that Ramble uh, and Dreisaitl Studios thinks about? Uh, yeah, so uh, working within cities, you know, uh, and, and the fact that cities are densifying quite quickly, uh, you know, you need to find spaces for nature. and. Uh, uh, as, as we um, use up the ground level, right? We have to find spaces for them, the elevated spaces. So in my previous projects in Kampong Emeraldi, where we actually uh, create a new ground plane, an elevated ground plane, uh, there's, there are many projects in Asia, all right, demonstrating this new approach, right? Uh, and, uh, and not just in Asia, actually increasingly uh, in most cities, they're providing spaces for nature and community on buildings itself. Um, so the many examples worldwide, uh, obviously uh, there's a lot more to do, right? Uh, it's, we are at the very start of this trend towards greening, uh, including uh, nature on inbuilt environments. And there are many ways to do it, uh, whether it's on the roof or at mid level or in interior spaces, it's all happening. Um, um, we, we just need to keep selling this, right? So that uh, more and more people adapt, uh, adapt uh, and adopt this approach. Yes, and from various from thank you for uh, answering this. And perhaps I can encourage Rita and Eric, if you want to type some uh, compliments to, to these answers as well, feel free to do so on the Q&A box. Um, I just see a related question from uh, Sean Kuhn. Um, a huge part of concerns with current climate change is the proportion of carbon emissions. I would like to get any insights, if any, 
on whether natural infrastructure can help to cut such carbon. Um, so perhaps I can um, give a first answer to, to this um, in the form of a paper that the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at NUS uh, in, in Singapore has just published, where they actually analyze the carbon um, reduction potential of reforestation in cities throughout the world. And they found that there was actually 25%, um, oh, there were a large number of cities that could uh, cut more than 25% of their emissions, which is actually quite high um, and higher than I would have thought because it was all often assumed that reforestation, um, especially in the form of tree planting, is uh, quite limited in terms of carbon sequestration uh, in, in cities. So this is uh, quite a significant finding. I'm happy to provide that reference if anyone is interested. Any additional input from the speakers on this carbon question? All right, well, let's go in the interest of time. Well, one last question maybe. Um, this, one question on uh, flooding, what would be a viable natural infrastructure solution to river runoff, which is playing an active part in the accumulation of suspended matter in water as well as coastal flooding? Um, Rita or Eric, would you want to take this water focus question? Actually, any of you. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think uh, the, the solution, I guess, you know, we need to uh, move away from just a single uh, top-down and big infrastructure solutions uh, because actually climate change uh, and uh, flooding affects everyone, right? And so here uh, uh, we need to uh, look at, again, I would say look at the context, the governance system, uh, what is actually suitable uh, for a particular governance system. Uh, in Singapore, the solutions are like this. Uh, how about in the Philippines, how about in Indonesia, we need to take uh, take into account how governments are, uh, how capable the governments are uh, and uh, and how capable the communities are, uh, how capable the, uh, the other stakeholders are, the businesses and all that. Um, and so one of the one of the problems that uh, in, in my experience in the, the Chilewong River in uh, Indonesia is that the, the, the flooding is not uh, primarily because of climate change, but it's because of the overdevelopment of the river uh, along the river. And so the disappearance of the spaces for water runoff during heavy rainfall days. So like Leonard mentioned, actually water needs space. And if you reduce the space for the water and build houses there, build other things there, then definitely it will flood elsewhere. The water will go elsewhere and it will flood the city. And so the solution is actually to give, you know, to, to again share the space with water. And when we talk about nature-based solutions, we are not just talking about greeneries and planting trees, you know, the blue, you know, the water is also very important. Uh, and so uh, having, uh, uh, having these spaces for water uh, in, in the river system itself, uh, there are there have been decreasing numbers of natural retention lakes actually in the river system uh, from over a hundred to just you know maybe about 50 of them. And so that's why there is always this big problem with flooding in Jakarta from the rivers. And so the solution will be to give back the space or to share the space uh, with water. And it's not just about it's it's not by you know a pouring concrete and uh, and banking all the rivers and try to control uh, the river and uh, and build all those levees right, but uh, actually there are uh, smaller scale solutions that everybody can uh, can do you know build uh, 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 the. Uh, the wells for water to actually go into the ground, uh, slow down the uh, the 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 river um, uh, the river water, and also there there has been you know speaking of uh, architecture, there has been um, uh, model houses actually that provides you know spaces for water, 
Uh, and it's not just in informal settlements like Eric has uh, described in his presentation, but there, uh, there has been uh, house, house designs that actually provide space for water when uh, the, the runoff actually increases. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, by decentralizing uh, this uh, solution for flooding, I think we can get somewhere because uh, it's not just about the big top-down solution, but actually to have solutions that are accessible to everyone. And uh, and that's, uh, that's one thing. That we Context appropriate. Thank you very much, Rita. Unfortunately, we are at time and I see some really interesting questions again in the chat box. So perhaps we, we can uh, also continue this conversation on the YouTube channel. I don't know if that's possible, probably. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just uh, wrap up by thank you again, uh, and thanking again everyone in the panel for sharing these insights. One hour is definitely too short, but I think we, we got a, a really good uh, um, insight into your work and uh, I encourage the audience to uh, reach out to you directly. Just wanted to mention the next two natural capital conversations uh, in September and October. Um, Glassnet Networks, I must say I don't know what this is, but I'm sure you'll find more information on the natural capital um, project website and then another one from the urban team uh, at the natural capital project. So do tune in um, for these next conversations. Thank you very much to the audience for connecting today uh, and uh, we'll be with you soon again on the YouTube channel. Thank you again.